Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. After the, for the, hey, for welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. Right next to me you can see is Clay Pierce, who's been a longtime volunteer on this TV show and just through a bunch of uh, nightmare in El Salvador. So we're happy to have you back, Clay. Thank you. And right next to me is Mr. Eric Llewellyn. How are you, Eric? Doing great. How are you doing, Paul? Very well. And then over in the wings, Mr. John Cornett is ready to play some music. Hey, John. Hey, Paul. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. We have uh, hip news for you tonight and uh, some video clips. Uh, so stay tuned as we bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. <laughs> All right, tonight's first story is from Washington, D.C. The Trump administration is asking Americans for input on whether marijuana should be reclassified under international drug control treaties, to which the United States is a party. Currently, under both U.S. law and global agreements, marijuana sits in the most restrictive category of Schedule I. Domestically, that means it's not available for formal prescriptions and research on its effects is heavily restricted. Globally, it means that nations that signed on to drug treaties are not supposed to legalize cannabis. But now, the United Nations World Health Organization is set to launch a review of the current international classification of marijuana, THC, cannabidiol, and other related compounds and preparations. And it wants input from member nations. In turn, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is asking interested persons to submit comments that can inform the country's position on the issue before it weighs in with the United Nations. Specifically, the FDA is inviting input on the abuse, potential actual abuse, medical usefulness, trafficking, and impact of scheduling changes on availability for medical use of cannabis and its compounds, the agency wrote in a Federal Register notice scheduled to be published next Monday. The World Health Organization's Expert Committee on Drug Dependence will meet in June to discuss marijuana's classification and will then make pre-review recommendations to the UN Secretary General about conducting a more in-depth analysis. Following that process, depending on the findings, cannabis could be rescheduled internationally, which would provide momentum to efforts to change marijuana's status under the laws of the United States and other countries. Marijuana itself has never been subject to formal review since first being placed in Schedule I of the International Agreement enacted in 1961, the United Nations Single Convention Treaty. The FDA notes in the new Federal Register Notice. Public comments are due to the FDA by April 23rd. Last month, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres used a speech before the body's Narcotics Commission to tout the drug decriminalization law in his home country of Portugal, which was enacted when he was Prime Minister. But also last month, the UN's drug enforcement body issued a report warning countries not to legalize marijuana. Our next story is from Washington, D.C. Uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, Republican of Kentucky and the Majority Leader of the United States Senate, has publicly announced his intention to sponsor federal legislation to legalize and fund the licensed production of industrial hemp. According to a press release issued by the Senator, the forthcoming legislation, entitled the Hemp Farming Act of 2018, quote, will allow states to be the primary regulators of hemp, end quote, and will, in, and, and will allocate grant funding to federally subsidized industrial hemp cultivation. The Senator previously shepherded federal reforms in 2014 permitting states to legally authorize hemp cultivation as part of an academic research pilot program. Over two dozen states have established regulations permitting limited hemp cultivation under this provision. 
In 2017, state licensed producers grew over 39,000 acres of hemp, up from roughly 1,600 acres in 2016, the year before. Legislation, H.R. 3530, is currently pending in the U.S. House of Representatives to exclude low THC strains of cannabis grown for industrial purposes from the federal definition of marijuana. That measure has 43 co-sponsors. According to a Congressional Research Service report, the United States is the only developed nation in which industrial hemp is not an established crop. Next story is from Lansing, Michigan. The politics of marijuana in Michigan might take another turn with the proposal asking residents if they support recreational use in the state expected on the November ballot. Now there's talk in the state capitol about legislatively approving recreational marijuana before it hits the ballot. The Republicans are, are timing this because the polling, current polling shows that if the vote was taken now, it would pass. It's also been proven to be an issue that turns out voters. In a very unique political year, the voters invested in the marijuana proposal could seriously impact other races. Medical marijuana usage passed by a wide margin in 2008 as 63% of Michigan voters said yes. Now, recreational cannabis is headed to the ballot, and while the signatures are still being vetted, there aren't many lawmakers in Lansing who don't think it'll win. The polls show that if the vote were today, it would pass with 55 or 56% of the vote, and it would also likely uh, increase voter turnout by 2 or 3%, which makes the GOP sources in Lansing wonder if they ought to legislatively pass recreational marijuana now. They're concerned that putting it on the ballot would cause them to lose control of the Michigan State House because more voters coming out would vote against Republicans. In an unpredictable election year, that's a very real conversion, conversation for lawmakers. Our next story is from right here in America. As the cannabis industry grows, generating an estimated $10 billion in annual sales, states are increasingly approving medical marijuana programs and passing adult use laws. But for marketing agencies, marijuana dispensaries, and cannabis brands, advertising cannabis brings its own hurdles. Online platforms with prime advertising space like Facebook and Google do not allow cannabis or other drug-related promotions on their sites, leaving a large share of marijuana advertising to blogs, podcasts, newsletters, billboards, and the print media. And while experts say Facebook and Google, which control the vast majority of digital advertising in the United States, they say they're unlikely to change their policies until cannabis is legalized at the federal level, and television and radio stations come with their own sets of rules, industry members are left to navigate a complex web of state-by-state -state regulations. According to Facebook's policy, ads cannot promote the sale or use of illegal prescription or recreational drugs. That includes images of recreational or medical marijuana, even in places where the drug's legal. A Google spokeswoman said marijuana ads are not allowed on the site because the drug is still illegal at the federal level. The policy applies to all Google ads as well as other sources like in-app ads and video ads. 29 states and the District of Columbia have medical marijuana programs and eight states plus the District of Columbia have adult use laws on the books according to the National Cannabis Industry Association. Facebook has rejected or taken down cannabis related ads and posts inconsistently and that requests for an updated advertising policy have gone unanswered. In one instance Facebook has even blocked an advertisement for an event to lobby politicians in Washington DC on marijuana related issues. Facebook did not return a request for comment. A number of trade publications cater directly to the marijuana industry, like High Times and the Marijuana Business Magazine, but broader online television or radio restrictions often relegate marijuana advertising to outlets like billboards. But even that approach carries certain contradictions. For example, billboards often carry their own laws as to images that can't be featured or what percentage of viewers must be adults. Our next story is from Salt Lake City, Utah. Republican Governor Herbert, Gary Herbert of Utah, has signed a series of bills to facilitate access and research to cannabis and cannabis-related products. House Bill 195 provides Utah patients with no more than a six months to live uh, the legal options to access cannabis-infused products. 
Under the law, patients with a physician's recommendations may legally possess up to a one-month supply of the products. All cannabis products must be obtained from state-approved providers. Access to herbal formulations of cannabis are not permitted under this new Utah law. Utah's House Bill 197 permits the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food to contract with a third party to cultivate cannabis for the purpose of manufacturing marijuana-infused oils and other related products. These products would be provided to terminally ill patients and also used in state-sponsored research trials. The new program is required to be operational by January 1st of 2019. Finally, Utah Senate Bill 130, the Cannabidiol Product Act, establishes rules for the licensed cultivation of industrial hemp for the purposes of manufacturing CBD in infused products. These products must contain a 10 to 1 ratio of CBD to THC. These products are intended to be sold at cannabidiol qualified pharmacies to patients with written recommendation from a physician. Utah lawmakers signed legislation into law in 2014 per, uh, permitting patients with intractable epilepsy the option of possessing certain CBD infused products. However, that law provided no legal in-state supply source for the products. Utah activists have collected over 160,000 signatures from registered voters in support of a 2018 statewide ballot initiative, the Utah Medical Cannabis Act permit qualified patients to obtain either herbal cannabis or cannabis infused products from a limited number of state licensed dispensaries. Last week, a representative from Utah's Lieutenant Governor's Office confirmed that state officials had validated 117,000 of those signatures, more than the 113,000 needed to qualify the state ballot. Our next story is from Indianapolis, Indiana. Indiana's Republican Governor Eric Holcomb has signed legislation, uh, Indiana Senate Bill 52, authorizing the retail sale of certain hemp extract products. Under the measure, retailers may legally sell low THC hemp extract products that possess a certificate of analysis prepared by an independent drug testing laboratory. The testing must confirm that the products contain no more than 0.3% THC. Additional packaging and labeling requirements take effect on July 1st. Hemp extract products uh, may be derived from or contain any part of the plant cannabis sativa that meets the definition of industrial hemp and that contains no other controlled substances. In 2017, Indiana lawmakers approved legislation permitting for the use of products containing at least 10% CBD and no more than 0.3% THC for patients with treatment-resistant epilepsy. However, the law again provided no legal source for supply of the product, and state police have consistently cited the law's lack of clarity as justification for raiding dozens of CBD retailers. In February, justices for the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals heard oral arguments challenging the federal government's contention that hemp-derived CBD products are illegal in the United States. The judges have yet to render an opinion in that matter. Our next story is from Germany. Cannabinoid treatment is associated with improvements in dystonia in patients with early onset Huntington's disease, according to observational data published online in the Journal of Huntington's Disease. A team of investigators from Germany and Austria assessed the treatment of various synthetic or organic cannabinoid preparations, including Sativex, Drabinol, or Marinol, and Nabilum, in uh, seven Huntington disease patients who've been unresponsive to conventional therapies. The uh, authors wrote, quote, treatment with cannabinoids in all cases led to an improvement of motor symptoms mainly driven by improvement of dystonia, end quote, the authors concluded. Patients generally reported no relevant side effects. Huntington's disease is a degenerative brain disorder that often goes unresponsive to conventional treatments. This study, Cannabinoids for Treatment of Dystonia in Huntington's Disease, appears in this month's Journal of Huntington's Disease. Our next story is from Lexington, Kentucky. The enactment of statewide marijuana legalization laws is associated with a reduction in opioids prescribed and filled, according to two studies published online Monday in the Journal of the American Medical Association Internal Medicine. In the first study, Investigators from the University of Kentucky and Emory University assessed the relationship between medical and adult use marijuana laws 
and opioid prescribing patterns among Medicaid enrollees nationwide. The enrollees included all Medicaid fee for service and managed care enrollees, a high risk population for chronic pain, opioid use disorder, and opioid overdose. Researchers reported that the enactment of both medicalization and adult use laws were both associated with reductions in opioid prescribing rates, with broader legalization policies associated with the greatest rates of decline. They concluded, quote, state implementation of medical marijuana laws was associated with a 5.88% lower rate of opioid prescribing. Moreover, the implementation of adult use marijuana laws which all occurred in states with existing medical marijuana laws, was associated with a 6.38% lower rate of opioid prescribing. The further reductions in opioid prescribing associated with the newly implemented adult use marijuana laws suggest that there were individuals beyond the reach of medical marijuana laws who may also benefit from using marijuana in lieu of opioids. Our findings that the lower opioid prescribing rates associated with adult use marijuana laws were pronounced in Schedule II opioids further suggests that reaching these individuals may have greater potential to reduce the adverse consequences such as opioid use disorder and overdose." End quote. In the second study, the University of Georgia researchers evaluated the association between the enactment of medicinal cannabis access laws and opioid prescribing trends among those eligible for Medicare Part D prescription drug coverage. The researchers reported that medicalization and specifically the establishment of brick and mortar cannabis dispensing facilities correlated with significantly reduced opioid prescription drug use. This study's authors concluded, quote, this longitudinal analysis of Medicare Part D found that prescriptions filled for all opioids decreased by 2.11 million daily doses per year from an average of 23 million daily doses per year when a state instituted any medical cannabis law. Prescriptions for all opioids decreased by 3.7 million daily doses per year when medical cannabis dispensaries opened. Combined with the previously published studies suggesting cannabis laws are associated with lower opioid mortality, these findings further strengthen arguments in favor of considering medical applications of cannabis as one of the tools in the policy arsenal that can be used to diminish the harm of prescribed opioids." End quote. The study's findings are consistent with those of numerous prior papers concluding that legal cannabis access is associated with decreases in opioid use, abuse, hospitalizations, and mortality. The full text of these studies, Association of Medical and Adult Use Marijuana Laws with Opioid Prescribing for Medicaid Enrollees, and Association between U.S. State Medical Cannabis Laws and Opioid Prescribing and Medicare Part D Populations, appears in this month's edition of the Journal of the American Medical Association's Internal Medicine. That's the end of our hemp news segment tonight. Now, Mr. John Cornett has a song for us. Hey, welcome back, John. Uh, hey, Paul. And as I said before, welcome back, Clay. It's a freaking miracle, brother. You know, <clears throat> if you only know how many prayers were going out to you, uh, he's going up there to take his seat now while I'm playing this song. <laughs> anyway, let me get right to this song. I wrote this song... <clears throat> around the first time I started coming around here. And uh, I didn't like the word marijuana because the man uses that. I thought it was better to use cannabis. But just as a kind of a, you know, compromise, I wrote this song called Mariganja. So, you know, by any other, a rose is still a rose by any other name, right? But this is um, about Mariganja or cannabis. Ganja, we want Mary Ganja. Ganja, we want to grow Mary Ganja. Stick it in the ground, water it down, Mary Ganja. Ganja. We like 
Mary Ganja. Ganja. We like to share. Mary Ganja. It's renewable energy. Find clothes for you and me. Mary Ganja. Woohoo. like Mary Ganja Ganja we like to use Mary Ganja food and for food and medicine prohibition must end Mary Ganja woohoo just be careful how much you smoke before you play Ganja we love Mary Ganja Ganja, we like to use better ganja. Sometimes we get high, sometimes we do get high. Better ganja, woohoo! John. Thank you, viewers. Uh, hey, Clay, it's good to have you here. You've been around for about 13 days now, right? I think, well, more like 10, uh, 13 days out of prison, yeah. Yeah, 13 yeah. days since you arrived here. Uh, since I, yeah, since I got here. Since yeah, <laughs> it was Saturday a week ago. Right. It's hard to remember, I bet. So you were in prison in El Salvador. You know, we've been discussing your case here on on our TV show right. and uh, you know building up the excitement of course we were hopeful you get out of prison so was I but uh, <laughs> let's see you were first you were traveling between the United States and Columbia right and you were a legal medical marijuana patient here in Oregon in fact Correct. I'm I've been yeah. your grower right. so, yeah, so I, I know and have the cards about that <laughs> but you're also a legal medical marijuana patient in Columbia yes so you had some marijuana in your suitcase that you had checked. Just a little bit. I actually forgot I had it, but yes, I had some with me. It's kind of silly, but because yeah, yeah. I was in, still in the international spot, there was still I was still an American in American land. But you had a stop where you weren't leaving the airport, just right. a connecting just flight airport, right. in San Salvador, the capital right. of El Salvador. In no man's land, yeah. So, yeah. Know, in other words, in the airport, I never left that part of the airport. In yeah. The international spot. You, you, you weren't planning on visiting mm -hmm. El Salvador at all. Uh, you never looked into visiting <laughs> El Salvador. It just happened to be a connecting uh -oh. flight. <laughs> right. So on November 1st, you were at the El Salvador airport waiting for your connecting flight. Tell us what happened. Um, I just had this two guys come up to me and tap me on the shoulder, you know, kind of, hey, gringo. Uh -huh. <laughs> Literally, hey, gringo. And, uh, you know, and I would, had just been turned down for a uh, reservation for a rental car here because I wasn't going to get in town until 3 a.m., uh -huh. um, but I, uh, so I mean, they, they wanted to point to the corner of the room and point, you know, wanted me to go and talk to them. I said, okay, whatever. I wasn't too worried about it because I knew I was legal in, in the first place. Right. And so I talked with them or went over to the corner and talked with them and they said that uh, one of my packages downstairs had been alerted by a dog. Which one of your suitcases? Yeah. Well, it was a, it's a box. It's it got a, a box. machine okay. in it. Um, and there was no reason for him to be looking at the suitcase anyways because there was you were going to leave the airport right, not leaving the airport there's no reason for a dog to be looking at it. even if a dog did look at it there's no reason for him to check it they already been through security but in they Columbia said and the dog said it, it that's had what they told me that's what they told me they didn't yeah. tell my lawyer this or any, it's not in the, in the transcripts that for the uh, court or anything nothing about a dog just that they found marijuana in my bag so they went through my bag looking for probably for a battery because they knew it was a machine but I don't know, somehow they didn't think they could tell the truth there either. Um, 
so they, you know, they went through my backpack and they found marijuana, of course, along with some gifts for friends here, or not here, but in, in uh, Colombia, uh -huh. and um, proceeded to, to search for everything and, and even testing my marijuana and testing pills I had in my pocket because I had pharmaceutical drugs for my pain. That just you in, prescribed. Right, just in case I can't use cannabis, I use th these other pills and things. So you were, had, were in a major motorcycle accident back when you were a young man. Right, 1980. 1980, yeah. and so uh, you you took had a lengthy recovery and, and have very obvious injuries and disability oh, yeah. <laughs> regarding that, right? Yeah, seriously. Yeah. And so they give you pharmaceuticals <coughs> to help deal with that pain, and you quit using a lot of them using cannabis while yes. you were here in the United mm -hmm. States. Yeah, I, I, I was impressed that I could do it. It was literally completely on cannabis only and able to not even think about using opiates or any of the other uh, things like uh, muscle relaxers, Valium. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so uh, they pulled you aside at the airport and said you had, they wanted to look through your backpack and mm -hmm. once they found the, the marijuana, what happened? Oh, uh, they said, don't worry, it's just a technicality, you'll be on your way really soon. You know, and like, this one guy, is my interpreter, I guess, who really spoke poor English, um, kept telling me that. I mean, every five minutes, don't worry, it's just a technicality, we gotta go through this and then you'll be on your way. And I'm thinking, yeah, my flight flew an hour ago, so there's no way I'm going it right now. Right. Um, and then they, they started searching me, and they found some money I had on me, and then their entire focus changed, and their, their attitude changed. Um, I kind of knew the money was never coming back again. It sucks because uh -huh. it was... So you had some money because you just recently sold a, a trailer you had in the United States. Correct. And uh, you were going to Columbia to try to buy some real property. How, how much money did they seize? Ten, well... Almost nine thousand uh dollars. Uh huh. So yeah. it wasn't, not quite nine thousand. Yeah, actually, I thought it was more than that, but I, you know, I have to go with what they say on the paperwork. But even that's still a devastating amount. Right. Um, because you've been on disability for a long, long time. You're well, since uh, nineteen eighty. Since nine, since you were in that. Yeah. How long were you in the hospital in nineteen eighty? Two, two years. <laughs> two years. Yeah. That's a whole, a very long time. Yeah, it's, it was, I just set another record here at this, this uh, in El Salvador, I was there for 45 days. Mm -hmm. You were locked up in the El Salvador jail from yeah. November 1st until when? Until, uh, what is it? Sometime in January, right? Fe January or February. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So it's, it was, well, was more like think, yeah, 60 or 75 days. Something like that. Yeah, it was yeah. almost, uh, well, it was almost 90 days. Yeah, I was in the hospital for 65 or 45 days after that. Yeah, so tell us, so you were, I came and visited you down yeah. in, mm -hmm. in prison in El Salvador. Yeah. You didn't have any phone numbers. I and no one nothing. let you call anyone for a couple days. You no. want to tell our audience how. Complete blackout. Yeah, That's how it. you managed to, to <laughs> let us know here in the United States well, that uh, this was a couple of days after. You were first stopped on November 1st. October 31st, actually. October Halloween. 31st. No, it was actually stopped, but because of all the... So they interviewed me so long and denied me, you know, anything. Um, it was October 1st, or November is it? November 1st, uh -huh. um, when they actually arrested me. So it was like 12, 13 hours later. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But... Um, so then on November 3rd, I got a phone call from you. Right, yeah. How did that happen? Freeway. Well, I, don't know, I felt my life was at risk because of the money. I felt like I was going to end up in the ditch on the side of the road, which is very possible, even by because the guards only make two to four hundred dollars a month, if that. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking with them, kind of, because I don't really speak good good Spanish, but I got them to admit that they smoke cannabis, and I'm like, "You got to be kidding me! You're letting them black me out, you know, no communication with my family or friends or anything, and you know, no one's going to know where I'm at, or you know, I, I guess I got to the guy driving." And he let me use his telephone, and I remembered most of your phone number, and got through finally, and told you what would happen to me. The if only you had think of. had my phone number, oh, I'd been dead on the we side. We would of never have likely. known yeah. that you were arrested. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think anybody would have known what happened to me at all. I think they would have just like I never appeared in the airport. Like I say, even now my passport says I don't. I've never have been in El Salvador. Uh huh. Uh huh. So uh, that was on the third day, and I, you talked to me on the phone, mm -hmm. alerted me to this, right. and I went into to action trying to, I contacted the embassy there in El Salvador. Right, I didn't know about any of this stuff. I just right. thought maybe You didn't find away. out anything for some time. Almost three weeks. Yeah. Right. 
And tell us what happened after you talked to me on the phone there. After, and you'd already been incarcerated about three days at that point. About three days. I spent another three, four days in this anti-drug unit, they call it. And it's like a really heavily locked down jail cell where my cell is about seven feet by ten feet with a bathroom and a shower <laughs> in that space. And you're not allowed to get out of that during the entire day. You're, you're locked up and you can pace the floor. You can do push-ups with the, the, the bars or whatever. And... Uh, wash your clothes in the shower, but you can't get out, you know. Uh, the food was good, but you have to pay for it. It was dollar, dollar, dollar fifty a plate, depending on what you order. You order from the vendors on the street. And were you so able to buy food? Yeah, I had some, uh, I had, uh, <laughs> one of my neighboring cellmates gave me $20 until I got money, and she, she gave me $40 before I, before it all got worked out. I see. And then when I got a lawyer, which wasn't the one I picked, it wasn't Ricardo, who, also helped out with this. Um, also gave me forty dollars. So I had spent eighty dollars before I actually got my lawyer worked out. Uh -huh. about eighty dollars to buy your food because right. in jail in El Salvador they don't give you food. They don't no. give you a blanket. They no. don't give you anything <laughs> no. that you can't buy. No, you're right. That's that's the truth. I didn't have any money to spend but on food itself. And I was pretty easy going with it because at the first I'm thinking this is so all you had some say. money, almost nine thousand dollars, but you they took it from <laughs> they you. Took you it, they took it. They wouldn't let me have any of it. To Therefore, spend. you didn't have any food or Nothing, blanket yeah. or anything. I thought it was kind of mean. Yeah. It yeah. Was kind of, it was really screwed up, but I I was thinking it was a nightmare in the first place. I mean, or a dream possibly, and that I'd wake up any minute and it'd all be like a joke. You know, I'd be on a jet plane. It woke up, but that's not what happened. Right. You know, I did spend 75 reality. days in there. And so after they were in this drug unit, they moved you to what's pretty famous called Mariana, yeah, and it's Mariana. Uh, yeah. internationally renowned as one of the worst prisons in the world. That's what I read. I mean, it was, it was bad, and it wasn't, it wasn't torturous, not like it was in 2012. I've seen videos of places in 2012. It was way worse. They have different but sections in the prison, too, different... Like seven, uh, well, nine, I guess, because I yeah. was trying to get to Sector 9. I met the ex-president of the country. and Who was locked up in prison, too. <laughs> in prison for embezzlement, yeah. Um, but there was a few of his ca his cabinet, his group, that spoke English, and they spoke good English, and I made friends with them. Um, but they weren't in your sector? They weren't in my sector. I was in Sector 1, which is just a mash of all sorts of things. You know, I mean, you got just thieves and robbers and uh, uh, drug dealers and rapists and pedophiles and murderers, you know, just a mix. Not really hardened ones, first timers, I guess, is what, what it probably comes down to. Or it's not as, not habitual uh, offenders. Because uh -huh. all the hardened criminals were in other sectors, sector two, three, four. So five. then, eventually, you met a lawyer. A lawyer came to visit you, is that right? right? Yeah. It was one that, that we had found through uh, activists, our mm -hmm. friend Mike Bifari, uh, knew uh, an activist from El Salvador who was exiled in Germany, right. but he knew this lawyer, a young man who was just process of getting his it's law Ricardo. degrees. Ricardo, Ricardo. Yeah. how yeah. do you pronounce his last name? Uh, Langlos. He's called in on our show, and he might call in here tonight. But uh, good, right? a after how long a period of time before you actually met him? I think that was about three weeks. It's about the same time I met the other lawyer, which is was good, but not as good as Ricardo, and not as well affiliated with all my friends. I thought was unusual this, in this Martin Diaz in Germany. And without them, I probably would have died in prison because I got really sick in there. And without you guys' help, I would have still been in prison. So about December 20th, I got a visit arranged with you. And I flew down to San Salvador mm -hmm. on the 19th and then uh, met with the U.S. Embassy on the 20th and got to come in and see you on the 21st for about an hour. Right. Yeah. And until you came back here to America, uh, that was the last time I had seen you was down there yeah, in prison. Was, what was that like? Well, it was surreal. <laughs> I mean, because I, I still can't believe I was in prison there. I just, it's such a, something I don't want to think anybody ever has to go through it. I mean, because I was only accused. I wasn't convicted of anything. I'm still not convicted of anything. I'm innocent. Mm -hmm. But, but there were several, their judicial system's different there. You were bizarrely different. You were, uh... First, hell, you had one hearing that said they could hold you for 90 days until That's this the, second hearing. The starting the process, oh, yeah. It's a three-hearing process. Right. And so, uh, tell us more. Well, that's it. That's, it's, it's really kind of strange. I mean, without being uh, anything more than accused, they put me in this prison. And... Um, it was three months processo, and that's for them to find information out about me, whatever they want, and they lock me out. I mean, I'm, I don't have any telephone. I've got no, right. no money. 
so more access to people. I visited you on the 21st. We had an, a press conference mm -hmm. the next morning right. on the 22nd. I think we have some Spanish language news video okay. from mm -hmm. your arrest there. So uh, I think they can put uh, subtitles on this in our studio. Let's go ahead and run that Spanish language. Uh, it's about a two-minute video. We'll be right back. Pierce, un ciudadano norteamericano de 57 años que viajaba de Colombia hacia Oregon, Estados Unidos, el pasado primero de noviembre. Al hacer escala en El Salvador, inició la peor experiencia de su vida. Vino aquí el primero de noviembre de este año. El policía de la DAN le pregunta al señor Pierce, ¿está su maleta? Sí. ¿Lleva marihuana usted aquí? Sí. ¿Puede sacarla? Sí, la enseña, ningún problema, él siempre colabora. La razón por la que llevaba la marihuana es porque forma parte de sus medicinas, ya que usar la droga para este fin es legal en su estado de origen. Al momento de su captura presentó el permiso de portación, pero fue ignorado por las autoridades. El delito es en contra de la salud pública y no teniendo él la mínima intención de ingresar al país, ¿Cuál iba a ser la afectación a la salud pública? Actualmente se encuentra recluido en el penal de Mariona, en donde su estadía es un infierno, según sus abogados. Duerme en el concreto, duerme en el suelo, no tiene ninguna sábana, no tiene ningún colchón. Incluso este, ha tenido maltratos muy claros de parte de algunos guardias, en los cuales este, ni siquiera lo dejan usar el tiempo adecuado para sus necesidades básicas. El representante de la asociación a la que pertenece Clay asegura que había viajado a Colombia para asesorar a las comunidades indígenas sobre el uso de la marihuana como opción medicinal, ya que no existe prohibición en ese país para ello. Lamenta que un acto altruista tuviera este desenlace. Nosotros nos encontramos bastante tristes por la situación que está viviendo el señor Pierce aquí en El Salvador y mucha gente en Estados Unidos y en Colombia lo están extrañando. El director de centros penales dijo desconocer la situación del Estado unidense. Yo no le puedo confirmar si realmente la persona en este momento es víctima del bullying, ¿verdad? Por no hablar el idioma. Pero eh, vamos a verificar eso. Los abogados afirmaron que en el proceso son respaldados por la Embajada de los Estados Unidos y que harán todo lo necesario para que a Clay no se le violen sus derechos. Una de las acciones será solicitar una audiencia especial de revisión de medidas en el juzgado de instrucción de San Luis Talpa, que es donde se ventila el caso. Lorena Miranda, Telenoticias 21. So we got some publicity anyway. Yeah. And that seemed to have an impact on the court process. It definitely helped. And it, uh, Eventually, I sent over a lot of documents about your mm -hmm. medical marijuana permit here in the United States, your medical records, uh, uh, documents about your, your trailer sale, mm -hmm. and other things that were eventually used in court. Yeah, court was a little different. It was All I did was recite uh, statutes and, and how they were going to take things from me, and, and then at the end, they didn't. So... <laughs> You got really sick, and they decided mm -hmm. to let you go at one point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I got too sick to, to be held on to or, or for them to take care of me. And if we hadn't had this press conference and you hadn't been let go, mm -hmm. oh, you would have died in jail because yeah, you were in the hospital for how long? Uh, 45 days. 45 days. So yeah. you had a severe infection and had mm -hmm. to have a lot of dead tissue removed, right? Yeah. Was, I, I can't remember the word, Vernier's or Vernon, Vernon's gangrene. Uh-huh. It was a gangrene. Yeah, it was gangrene. So you had yeah. a severe infection. Apparently, uh, antibiotics weren't responding for a long time. I'm allergic to most of them, so they had to still give them to me. It was one of these situations where you're going to die anyway, so they just gave them to me anyways. Uh -huh. And they just did like a round robin. As I would get sick of one, they'd switch to another one. and try to keep ahead of them slightly and uh -huh. it seemed to work. I mean I'm still here so right but if you hadn't been let out and you'd been kept in yeah. jail oh, yeah, they, that was you would have you would have died in there yeah and I looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy when I was in, in prison just before they let me out I was all swollen up I mean everywhere and they thought I was faking it <laughs> how do you how do you fake edema I uh, don't know I don't think you can right it was it was different uh-huh so yeah I, I just um I, I, I was so out of it for the first, I'm still out of it, I don't, I'm still not awake, you know, because seriously, as you say, without your help and without everyone else's help, Martin Diaz, Ricardo Langlos, Don Worshafter, Donnie's been awesome for me, um, 
Donnie's an Ohio lawyer that I introduced you to right. a year before who, who's bought some land in right. and opened a hotel in Toribio. I think so, yes. Yeah. I think it's pretty happy. It, it, looks, it yeah. looks really nice. He's got a cannabis museum hotel right there in one of yeah. the prime cannabis growing regions. Yeah, it wasn't finished when I left. And I guess it has been finished since then. But right. Yeah, I right. hope to see it soon. <laughs> so after you got out of the hospital, then you went back to court a couple of weeks after that. Um, yeah, about... Three weeks later. There's newspaper uh, where you're, uh, also came about the time we were, uh, it has a picture from the press conference there, obviously. Right. And so uh, you heard about these while you were locked up. I did, Eric I says you're in the Mariana it. prison for yeah. $43 worth of marijuana. Uh -huh. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. yeah. So, but at first they were calling you an international drug yeah. smuggler, mm -hmm. right? Although you were charged end, with international drug smuggling. Right up to the end, very end, last few seconds. Like I you was had had drug tons smuggling. of marijuana. I still can't believe it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a little picture from that press conference as well. So, uh, fortunately, we got a lot of publicity there. and uh, I think that helped a lot. And there's an international tribunal. Uh huh. And it was brought up in the United Nations. Martin Diaz I mean, yeah. in Germany went to the. Uh, there's another newspaper article talking about it, and it's even got a picture from the Oregon Leaf of me on the cover back in 2014, which I right. found kind of surprising. But uh, I don't know where they got that picture because I didn't <laughs> give it to them. I was they must have pulled Leaf. it offline somewhere. Yeah. But uh, so finally, you went back to 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 court in late February. February 20th. Or 21st, 20th or 21st, I went to court. Spent a day there. It was like six hours. Supposed to be an hour, two hours maybe. I spent about six hours reading testimony back and forth, and um, got to say a little bit, but um, I because I, I, because of the language barrier still it's still that still occurred. Or, um, I don't. I couldn't communicate very well. I mean, yeah, you were sitting there listening <laughs> to him speak Spanish, and you didn't understand what they were right. saying. Well, he gave me an interpreter, and I had a harder time understanding her than his Spanish. I, I mean, I understood the Spanish of the judge better, and I understood the translator. But uh -huh. so, in one way or another, I did get the message. But um, I had to turn to Ricardo a few times to get him to translate for me, and it was it was a long day, and it was kind of backwards because if they were saying things like they were facts when they weren't, and then and again, probably because my Spanish, I don't understand it properly, but. In the end, I, I prevailed. I was allowed to go free. Um, so the judge ruled that you were a medical patient. Mm -hmm. Your medical mm -hmm. documents that we sent over and that helped I didn't, establish that. He said that I didn't have paperwork that doesn't exist. I don't think it exists in El Salvador. That says I'm a medical marijuana patient in El Salvador. There which, are no medical yeah. marijuana patients. In El Salvador. I'm like, you know, show me where the paper is. I'll I'll get one. But now I El Salvador be, be is there. is known as the most violent country in the world, with more murders than anywhere else in the world per capita. And San Salvador, the capital, is the most violent city right. in the world, with more murders per capita. So, you are in a really uh, dangerous situation there. Even yeah, when you weren't rough. in jail, even walking around felt kind of rough. I mean, Every little when I was there for three days. Every little store had somebody standing there with a shotgun, a 12-gauge right. shotgun, uh -huh. in front of every little store every and store. restaurant. Uh -huh. Some of them had multiple shotguns. Right, yeah. I, that's what I noticed. And then they, one day there was 23 people shot by two guys on a motorcycle. One motorcycle, two guys, one pistol. So 23? Pistol. We didn't, of course, hear anything yeah. about that not, on the yeah. media here in the United States. I posted something on Facebook. But yeah, 23 people in, in a day. And then over the course of 21 days, 210 people. So it's pretty violent. I mean, that's an average, actual, actual, exactly 10 people a day that get killed, which is equal to the United States. I mean, you just don't hear about them in the United States either. And, but uh -huh. this country is about half the size of, or this takes up the space about half of Oregon. It's right. not very big, and it's got a lot of people on it. And there's, I don't know, it, it, there is, there's a lot of police presence, and, and there's all these rifles and guns at doorways, and guns are illegal, and yet these guys get away with it. So. It, it was quite it a was, situation. It was silliness, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy. Everyone's got guns, but nobody does anything. When trouble happens, they hide, how I guess. Feel, how did it feel to come home and medicate again? Oh, it was awesome. Yeah, that yeah. freedom. I finally I got to relax a little bit. I'm I know still we got dazed. to hang out for a little bit and, yeah, and got to catch cool. up. And, yeah. yeah. Actually, that was some of the... F actually, I got some the night before, I think, a little bit my my host house. And it was... it was I hadn't smoked in five months, so it was, I was like getting stoned all over again. It's quite nice. Well, we are a live show. It is Friday, April 6th. If you have a question for Clay or Eric or I, 
you can call that number on your screen. It's 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. We've only got about 13 minutes left in the show. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you want to ask, Eric? Uh, you know, I just... Uh, all of it was horrible. We could, we already know that. But what, were, what was your worst part? I mean, obviously, you, you know, your life was in jeopardy. Probably but being infected and having a bunch yeah. of your tissue is cut away was pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, right? that was probably about the worst of everything. More, in in re retrospect, it is. That was the worst. Yeah. It's just a big I'm, open the, wound the, as they cut away your flesh, yeah, right? Yeah. Right. So I mean, I'm, I'm damaged. I need some reconstructive surgery, but. That's probably down the road. If I don't know if Oregon Health Plan will cover it or if I have to, but I'm I'm still fighting to try to pay the bills. Well, you're I've disabled, not on, on SSI, but you're also yeah. a, di a, a U United States veteran, right? No, no, no my you're son not. is and my father ah, was, okay. but I, I was okay. 4F because my leg. I see, yeah. I see. Okay. But I would have joined. Hmm? I would have joined back then. Uh huh. I see. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had seen something that said you were, so that's what made me think that. I guess Don had written it Maybe. at one point. Yeah, I don't know. I think I saw the same thing. Anyway, um, we're glad to have you back. You know, you'd volunteered on this show in the control room and behind mm -hmm. the cameras for, for how long? About, About 14 or 15 14 or years, 15 right? years, almost 15 years, yeah. Yeah, we've been on the air now for 21 and a half years, so <laughs> uh, time. you've been... Big uh, part of the show. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's a, a, a blessing you were finally able to get out of there, something that didn't look like was going to happen for some time. Yeah, well, so far I'm literally out on my, with just this close of my back, uh -huh. <laughs> quite literally. I still have things there, but there should be released any day. And if not, then I did, I just got out. But at least I'm out. There's nothing they can go to get me for except to keep my things or steal from me more. Uh -huh. so, but yeah. you're still, the lawyers are there fighting your, your, uh, Forfeiture of your money still, right? Uh, I think there's an appeal. I don't know if anything's going to happen with it. You know, the previous generals, just like the United States, once they get their mitts on it, they don't let go of it. just kind of want to be done with it all. <laughs> I don't want to be done with it all. I want my money back. <laughs> You're not going to go back to get it. I'm not going yeah, back yeah. to get it. There's no way I'm stuck with it. I thought El Salvador was a beautiful country. Yeah, it's uh, it's a, right near San Salvador, there's this big crater lake, just like yeah. our national park here in Oregon. The capital is built around this huge volcanic crater lake that has a, a, a volcanic island in the middle of it, just like Wizard Island at, at Crater Lake National Park. I didn't get Park. to see it. You didn't get to see no, it? I almost was, but... Well, I saw it in the distance from up on top of one of the volcanoes when I was at a restaurant and ran into that, that prison guy there. I'll see it from Google Earth or something. Anything <laughs> else you want to tell our audience? Uh, me? Yeah. Oh, I'm happy to be back. I'm happy to be out of prison. I want to thank you very much so for saving my life because I would be dead. And if it weren't for you or Don Wershafter or, Martin Le or Ricardo Langlois or uh, Martin Diaz, 420, Nat Normal Baker, um, you, all you guys have. Yeah, Normal, came out this, this out Philadelphia the activist, yeah. uh, 420 Baker, he. Uh, I'd known him from several events around the country, and he jumped up and helped put together a website, as did our partner, Michael Bacara. We have a phone call. Let's go ahead and take that call. Welcome to the show, caller. Hello, caller. Hello. Hey, how are you? Good. I was just wondering why the, the guy who went down there in the first place. What? Why I went down there in the first place. I went to Columbia and fell you in love with Columbia. You were uh, going to Col We went to Columbia yeah, and actually, worked yeah, on a, right. uh, I gave a speech in Columbia. And you really loved it yeah, and wanted I to go back and, yeah. and, and live else. there. Yeah. So you were going back to, Arrange to, that, yeah. to work with that museum hotel and mm -hmm. the Native American people there, right? Right. To produce medical marijuana, which is legal there. Right, yeah. Uh, we well, have another well, caller. Well, Welcome to the show, caller. Hello, Hello caller. I just wanted to, I just wanted to say, thank you all and God bless you for what you've done for the cause, and what you've been through. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm proud to do it. Proud to be able to make a little difference. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. All about. I guess we have I'm another sure call. A lot of people care about you that haven't spoke up. 
You had a lot of people who you never met that actually helped yeah, too, hundreds right? Of people. There's yeah, I got a stack yeah. of cards and stuff. You can still support me. It's just go to freeclay.org and donate. I've got a lot of bills. You still owe the lawyers and the, <laughs> the, the, the hospital. The hospital money, fees right? are the biggest thing. You yeah. still need your help. Yeah. <laughs> but we're glad to have him back. Okay, we have another call. Let's take that other call. Welcome to the show, caller. Hello. 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 Hi, Paul. This is Ricardo. Hey, Ricardo. Hey, Ricardo. You are Clay's lawyer down there. I got to, to meet you and hang out with you. Thank you, Ricardo. No problem at all. Um, I just wanted to. I was just watching the show in my phone, but um, um, I need to make a call. But I cannot see the show simultaneously, so it's a little bit difficult. So I just wanted to. It's glad to see Clay it's doing fine. He's doing fine. Also, I've been enjoying the the show. Uh, the last times I've, I've seen it. And, you got and well, I Clay out of jail yeah. with your legal work, and then you took him into your own home with your mother and father for some time there. Before he went in the hospital and after he got out of the hospital. And we want to thank you for, yes. for giving him a place to stay because obviously they took all his money. <laughs> yeah, it's still a pending issue. Um, actually, there are some couple of things that we need, to, we need to keep going because the prosecutor's office is not doing anything easy, but we're still fighting on. So hopefully everything goes through and everything is being sold uh, permanently. But, but uh, again, the prosecutor's office is doing everything complicated, not just because of this case, but in general, with all, with all cases that we see and some other cases that other people have. It's, it's getting a little weird here, actually. It's always been pretty dangerous there, and, and we're, we're very happy that uh, Martin Diaz was your friend and you got to come in here and help Clay, because if he hadn't been let go there, he would have died there in prison, wouldn't he? Well, I, I, I really don't want to talk about that because maybe the other lawyer would have done a, a good job or maybe not. I don't know. But, but still, that, that's what we needed to do anyway. So I, I, it's, it, I'm glad that Clay's doing fine and he had some cannabis too. He was a, a little desperate for, for having a little. But it's fine to see him calm because it, there, there's a lot of stress in this country and Obviously, some people, even my, including myself, sometimes that we're very stressed out here because of the of the environment. But yeah, uh, it, I know the court, it, the prosecutor even accused you of, of trying to, you know, saying you were going to do something, which you would never have done. Well, I mean, the drugs. Yeah, I never did it. Uh, actually, when that, that special hearing where Clay was supposed to be freed uh, at first, the prosecutor was saying that I would uh, administrate or I would provide cannabis to Clay. And I was like, hell no. Uh, I mean, that was, that was an attack against me, not even the arguments he provided in the hearing. So that was very disrespectful from that, from that prosecutor. And that's a, that prosecutor is a very difficult one. Uh, I just read lately about him. He's always trying to pursue something, even if it's not a crime, just because someone has a, a drug possession, even just for personal consumption. So that, that person is also a little difficult, too. So, so in El Salvador, if you have less than two grams of marijuana, how long can you spend in jail for less than two grams? Uh, between one to three years. And f he had a little <laughs> bit more than an ounce. What, was, what sentence was he looking at because he had $43 worth of marijuana? Uh, well, actually, that was uh, drug possession without the intent of drug trafficking. So that was basically be uh, three to six years of prison. Uh, the first charge that he had that was international drug smuggling, that was 15 to 20 years. And that's because the prosecutor interpreted, uh, interpreted that because he was in a plane, he was in the airport, he was traveling through, and because he was going overseas, that was enough to say that it's an international drug smuggling. Well, there was no investigation whatsoever, uh, there was no drug alert, uh, drug alert at all, and anything. So... That was very excessive from the prosecutor, too. And even the judge in the first year said, that, oh, this is not a drug trafficking thing, it's a, just a drug possession. And then the chamber confirmed that there was no drug, uh, no intent of trafficking. So that's the reason why Clay got released, because we appealed the first time. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we really thank you for sticking in there and representing them, Ricardo. You did great work. And thanks for calling in tonight, too. Is there anything else you'd like okay. to tell our audience? Well, hello, hello again. I just wanted to say hi to everyone now, everyone, everyone over there watching the show. And I hope every, uh, you enjoy the time over there. And make sure you fight for your rights, uh, because if you don't fight for your rights, you'll become what, what this country is. A very repressive and very uh, excessive country in regards to to drugs and, and and all related topics. So keep fighting and don't lose your rights. All right, thank you. Thanks for calling in, Ricardo. Thanks for your work. No problem. Thanks, Ricardo. So we are down to just less than three minutes left. Is there anything mm -hmm. you want to say in closing, Clay? Um, just that I'm glad to be back. Uh, if you've got extra money in your pocket or in your bank, you can go to freeclay.org and make a donation you help need a out. donation yeah. to help you so freeclay.org and you can make a uh, gofundme donation that Correct. would be very helpful to you anything you'd like to say eric a lot of hard people have been putting in some work may 5th the oregon cannabis global or oregon cannabis global festival march uh pioneer square to high noon come out celebrate talk talk uh, enjoy cannabis so that's saturday may 5th saturday may down 5th, at yeah. pioneer yeah. courthouse square i know we have a poster we'll probably pop that up at some time here yeah. and say no to opioids Always. there's the poster and so if you uh are looking for a doctor to help you like find that. uh get medical marijuana or a medical marijuana recommendation we have a physician referral service you can call us at 503-235-4606. That number there on your screen, 503-235-4606. If you have any other messages you want to get through to us or talk about marijuana or you have any of those conditions and are looking for a doctor, please call us at 503-235-4606. All right. Thank you, Clay. Yeah, thank thank you. you, Eric. Thank you, John. John is uh, going to play a song as we go out on our last minute here. Thank you, viewers. We'll be back live next week and help us restore him. I like that. Hit it. All we really want to see is humanity set free. Just one big family. Once united, we are free. Now's the time to make a stand. Do the best each one can. We're just one big family. Once united, we are free. Now's the time to make a stand. Do the best that each one can. Just one big family, once united, we are free.